All right, everybody, it's Jay Steven here, and last time we discussed the context for the Crusades, as in what uh, the Christian and Muslim world were, worlds were like at the, at the dawn of the Crusades with the First Crusade in the uh, 11th century. So today we're going to talk about is the origin of the concept of holy war in Christianity. This is a very interesting topic, so... Let's jump into it. So, when in Christian thinking is killing another human being justified? Okay, so around the time of the Second Crusade, an Anglin, an excuse me, an Anglo-Norman priest, by the name of Raoul, wrote the following: He is not cruel who slays the cruel. He who puts the wicked men to death is a servant of the Lord, because they are wicked, and there is ground for killing them. Okay, so this pretty much gives us some insight into the thinking around the era of the Crusades about uh, what was going on with the warfare in the Holy Land and in Spain and, and, in, and in other theaters of Crusade. The idea was, this is justified killing. This is justified warfare. Um, indeed, this is uh, the the man engaging in this activity is a servant of the Lord. Uh, there is reason to engage in this uh, this killing. It is it's justified. This was not at all surprising to anybody in uh, medieval Latin Christendom at this time in the twelfth and thirteenth centuries. Pretty much everybody would have thought that this made perfect sense. Uh, there wasn't this question, like today, there seems to be quite a bit of anxiety among Christians about how to justify uh, uh, the use of force. Is uh, the use of force uh, ever okay? Uh, Christians seem to debate this widely. So, Stephen Runciman, writing much later than our Anglo-Norman priest, Raoul, <laughs> uh, indeed writing in the 20th century, he had this scathing criticism of the Crusades with which he ended uh, he ended his book his three volume series of books about the Crusades with this criticism and it was holy war itself was nothing more than a long act of intolerance in the name of God which is the sin against the holy ghost so Stephen Runciman said this and this is one of Runciman's many enormous errors uh Stephen Runciman's books about the Crusades are terrible, historically speaking. I still get people messaging me saying, oh, have you read Stephen Runciman? Yeah, Stephen Runciman is not a reliable source for Crusades history. He had a very anti-Crusader agenda in his writing. He was extremely butthurt about the, uh, the capture of Constantinople in 1204. That was everything for him. Everything he wrote about the Crusades was colored by his extreme... Uh, inner pain and turmoil over the fact that a Western army had captured Constantinople in 1204. He could not let that go, and he could not write objectively about the Crusades because of that. And he, quite frankly, lied many times in his uh, assessment of the sources. And uh, this little scathing criticism with which he ended his three-volume work on the Crusades is just a perfect example of some uh, stupid things Stephen Runciman says. You know, we could do a little book. <laughs> Dumb things Runciman says. Um, so think about how ridiculous this is. Uh, the Holy War itself was nothing more than a long act of intolerance in the name of God, which is the sin against the Holy Ghost. I mean, this is not consistent with traditional Christian theology throughout the centuries. Uh, tolerance, intolerance in the name of God, this is a 20th century concept. Hands down, this is something that somebody thinks in the post Enlightenment era, post post Enlightenment era. Uh, this is this is something that a 20th, 20th century person is going to to say in the Western world because there's this idea of pluralism that religion should have no bearing on your national allegiances or on um, or on the uh, country's identity. That countries shouldn't have religious uh, con uh, confessional religions. This is just not the way people thought for centuries, for most of human history. Um, intolerance of the enemies of God was a norm 
throughout Jewish and Christian history. Traditionally, there was no conflict between Christ's message of peace and love and the application of force for justice. So let's, let's delve into that. In the way that Christians have traditionally looked at this concept of turn the other cheek, today Christians look at this turn the other cheek thing, or a lot of Christians, and they, they see in that an indictment of any use of force or any resistance, indeed, to tyranny. Uh, the idea that a Christian should just be a passive person who receives all violence humbly and uh, submissively. Um, this is not how Christians, most Christians, have viewed this through history. The idea was that this scripture applies to the conduct of the private person. And indeed, the scriptures themselves uh, create an emphasis in, uh, well, point out the difference here. You know, the obligations of the private person versus the obligations of the state. A private person might shun violence and prefer not to to respond um, to an insult in kind, but the state has certain obligations. In the Gospels, Christ talks about giving to Caesar what is Caesar's, distinguishing political from spiritual obligations. John the Baptist in the Gospel of Luke tells soldiers to remain in the army and accept their pay. Now, one reason this was this was so uh, clear to Christians in the Latin uh, Christian world was because of these two different Latin words. Uh, inimicus, which refers to a personal enemy, and hostis, which refers to a public enemy or an enemy of uh, the nation, the people, the the collective. So in the Latin Vulgate, uh, when it talks about like loving your enemies, for example, uh, it's this word inimicus. So, and I think when we look at the way these concepts played out in the medieval world, we can see that when when Christians uh, in in Latin Christian Europe heard this idea of uh, love your enemy, for example, they interpreted this as a fellow Christian. So like, um, you know, Count Bob up the road, who uh, he lays claim to this uh, field that actually should be mine, and so we've been fighting over it for, for, you know, who knows how long. Well, that's your enemy. You should actually be loving Count Bob. You shouldn't be, be hating him and uh, wanting to uh, fight with him. Um, that's where this kind of turn the other cheek thing comes into play. Whereas when Christians were dealing with uh, these these very foreign and strange enemies to them. Uh, these these non-Christian powers, uh, the Saracens, for example, um, they they didn't view it that way. They this was where the collective goes to conflict with this uh, this danger to all of Christendom. So it wouldn't have made sense to to these Christians, to your average Latin Christian in the Middle Ages, to turn the other cheek to a Saracen because a Saracen is threatening to uh, uh, stomp out uh, the Christian practice entirely. And so that's, that's the issue. The Old Testament presents this idea of legitimate war that pleases God. Uh, think of the Israelites, the campaigns of Joshua, King David, and in, indeed uh, the Maccabees, Judas Maccabeus. Uh, the Maccabees were a huge uh, symbol in the Crusades era uh, of, of righteous warfare. The Old Testament was very important in uh, medieval Latin society. We have this idea, or some people incorrectly have this idea, that uh, the Bible was somehow uh, not known or understood by medieval Christians. This is ridiculous, like the church was hiding it from them or something. Um, no, uh, your average Christian had a very good concept of what was in uh, the Old Testament and the New Testament. Uh, they heard these things uh, uh, said at mass. Um, a lot of the uh, the aristocracy uh, had some knowledge of Latin, you know, at, at least enough to keep up. Uh, some more than others, but at least enough to keep up uh, with with the scriptures and the various songs. Uh, people knew these stories. People knew the fact that the Israelites had fought battles for their faith. Uh, God told Moses to slay the followers of the golden calf. 
God told Saul to slay the Amalekites. Uh, there were various warrior heroes throughout the, the uh, Old Testament. Joshua, Gideon, David. The Old Testament presents victory as the work of God through his followers who, you know, as an army, meet their enemies with hymns and prayers. Okay, so, so think about this. Think about how um, for crusaders, you know, in the, when Pope Urban was calling the first crusade and, and as we get into the era of the crusades, crusaders hear this stuff, um, you know, this, this stuff that's, that's from sac- sacred scripture, you know, these ideas of these this warfare, God uh, leading the Israelites into battle, this resonated with them. Um, you can see how, I mean, the question of, you know, is this the right thing to do didn't even come up because this was, this was the, at, the, at the core of the faith. A lot of uh, the Bible has relevant scriptures that to crusaders seem to speak directly to their experience. Here's a couple. So fighting with their hands and praying to God in their hearts, they laid low no less than 35,000 and were gladdened by God's manifestation. That's uh, from uh, 2 Maccabees 15, 27 through 8. O God, the heathen are come into thine inheritance. Thy holy temple have they defiled. They have laid Jerusalem on heaps. Psalm uh, Psalm 79. So there again, I mean, this, this speaks directly to the Crusaders. Uh, and this is, you know, Jerusalem is held by God's enemies. I mean, this, is, this stuff w- was immediate and relevant in the era of the Crusades. Uh, one of our primary chroniclers of the First Crusade, uh, the priest Raymond, who was the chronicler for uh, Count Raymond IV of Toulouse, actually used scripture to describe the sacking of Jerusalem in 1099 by the first crusaders. Raymond said, it is sufficient to relate that in the temple of Solomon and the portico, crusaders rode in blood to the knees and bridles of their horses. So this has been incorrectly interpreted many times uh, by um, uh, modern commentators that, uh, oh, well, there was so much blood in, in the city of Jerusalem when it was taken by the crusaders that it was coming up to the knees of their horses. Well, no, in fact, uh, Raymond was quoting uh, Revelation 14.20, and the winepress was trodden without the city, and blood came out of the winepress, even unto the horse's bridles. So you can see how the way that the crusaders were interpreting what they were experiencing, what they were doing, it was coming directly from the very heart of the Christian faith, from Scripture. I think that um, when we're assessing this issue, the real que- question we need to ask ourselves isn't how did the crusaders justify holy war with their Christian faith, but how do Christians today uh, justify their refusal to acknowledge this aspect of the faith? Or perhaps a better way to put it is why do Christians think that there, there's some issue to, to be solved when it comes to the crusades or that there's, there's some deviation? from from the faith here. Okay, so in addition to Holy Scripture and the Old Testament, another source for ideas of justified violence for uh, the medieval Latin Christian world comes from uh, the Greco-Roman world, uh, Aristotle and Aristotle's concept of just war. Aristotle said that war is for justice, not for personal wealth or gain. It's got to be uh, for the sake of self-defense or for the maintenance of the state's independence, so to prevent uh, the the society from coming under subjugation from a a foreign society. Also, it's justified to obtain an empire for the benefit of the citizens. So that's that's, uh, something that would be hard for us to grasp in the modern world in many cases, but but that was Aristotle's uh, concept. Uh, And also... This is a very interesting concept from Aristotle, to enslave non-Hellenes or non-Greeks or barbarians who deserve slavery. So Aristotle thought that um, war could be justified if you were conquering a group that merited slavery or merited subjugation. But the key concept in Aristotle's uh, idea here is just cause. So war isn't just like, okay, we're going to go plunder 
so that I can get rich, so the king can get rich, or this group of warriors can get rich. There's got to be a just reason for it. Um, uh, in the Roman world, this would kind of be more specified in the causa belli, which is the, the breaking of an obligation or an, an injuring done to the other party. The Roman word for peace, pax, uh, kind of amounts to pact, this idea of an agreement. So war happens when there is a, a breaching of contract between two parties. So it's legitimate to go to war uh, if, if two powers have an agreement and one power betrays that agreement. You break the pacts. Uh, in, of course, in, the, in the, the Roman concept, we have this concept of the public enemy, the hostess. So that, that's a barbarian deserving of defeat or attack. All right, so as we get into the 4th century, uh, Christianity is going to become the official religion of the Roman Empire. And so within this, con uh, this context of uh, uh, Roman Christianity, we get this combination of this idea of uh, Jewish just war, or excuse me, uh, Jewish wars fought for the faith combined with uh, the Greco-Roman just war. So, so yeah, as um, the Roman state becomes Christian, so we get this the Christian Roman Empire of the fourth century. Um, the Roman state is kind of the instrument of God's order. Uh, the, the Roman state is the protector of the faithful. The enemies of the faith are legitimate targets for the Roman state. So heathens, uh, infidel barbarians, heretics, that kind of thing. Um, so we can see how there's this uh, really increasingly close association of, of you know, the Roman government itself ha has this sacred duty of uh, being uh, the, the God's um, enforcement arm in the world. Uh, the idea of Christian pacifism is kind of viewed as more this unique role of the clergy. So the clergyman, he doesn't carry weapons. He's not going to uh, fight back with violence if he's, uh, if he's attacked. Um, that's the role of the soldier, the Christian soldier, the Christian state. It's the, the role of the Christian uh, uh, army, the Christian empire, to protect that clergyman who is peaceful. And in this context, heresy becomes treason against the state. Now, a lot of these ideas get really um, perfected or clarified by St. Augustine in the 5th century. St. Augustine's idea of just war becomes deeply influential. It, it shapes Christian thinking about war for centuries to come. Thomas Aquinas would, would draw heavily on it. Um, so the idea is war can be used to combat sin. Um, you have to have the right cause for war, and those waging the war have to have the right intent. And within this context, the fifth commandment is not broken. So, the ki so killing in this context can be justified. So really it comes down to, Augustine sort of defines these four maxims or, uh, or aspects that a war has to have for it to be just. You've got to have just cause. So, you know, for example, um, an unprovoked attack or uh, the, the conquest of a territory that is rightfully held by those who lose it, um, the abuse of the innocent, something like that. So that gives a power just cause to go to war, not just to plunder, not just, well, we want to take, uh, you know, uh, let's, let's see how wealthy we can get by going to war. No. Uh, the second maxim has to be defensive, uh, the recovery of right or th for the recovery of a rightful possession. So it can't be like uh, inherently uh, offensive. It can't be like, uh, well, we're just going to conquer for the sake of conquest. No, it needs to be uh, a recovery or rightful in some way, uh, necessary for defense. Um, so think about how the Crusaders would think of the reconquest of Spain and the reconquest of the Holy Land. These were both viewed very much as reconquests. This territory had been Christian, and now 
we're going to retake it again. It's, it's under occupation by an illegitimate authority. Now we will retake it. This is exactly how the Crusaders viewed it. Uh, the third maxim for Augustine is a legitimate authority has to sanction this war. So it can't be just Bob off the street. It's got to be the emperor or the general, you know, the, the, uh, the just uh, ruler of the society who can declare war. And finally, uh, right intent. Now, this is interesting. So the mindset of those prosecuting the war is important. important. They can't be thinking, well, you know, this looks just, but really why we're doing this is because it's going to make us rich or we get to plunder something. No, their heart has to be in the right place. Um, we'll see this concept become very relevant in the Crusades. Um, you have to change your life to earn the crusade indulgence. You can't just go off on crusade and because you're going through the motions, you get the indulgence. No, you've got to renounce sin. You've got to commit yourself to uh, following God's law and, and no longer repeating those same sins. You've got to uh, be a committed Christian. That's how you can be a, 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 tr a crusader who actually merits in God's eyes. Now, one thing that's worth noting here is that just war Bellum Eustem is not yet sacred war. Bellum Sacrum. So in Augustine's world, he's, uh, he's uh, laying out for us the cases in which warfare could be justified. It doesn't mean it's holy. Augustine doesn't, Augustine doesn't have this concept of, oh, well, Warfare can be, there's a certain type of warfare that, that could be like the activities of a monk, the vows of a monk, and the, the life of a, of a monastic uh, a brother. But in the high middle ages, this is, these two concepts are separate and both understood. So, for example, in the high middle ages, you might have just cause to go to war with the king of France. So it might be possible for you as the king of England, for example, to go to war with the king of France and it's justified because he wronged you or something. And so you're not breaking the fifth commandment by engaging in war with him. But it's, it's never going to be uh, sacred warfare. It's never going to be uh, uh, spiritually meritorious. Like if you go to war with uh, the sultan of Egypt or um, the emir of Damascus or the, the caliph in Baghdad or the caliph in Cordoba or whatever, you know the emir of Cordoba, the ruler of, uh, of Granada, you know, and he, um, it's, 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 it can be sacred. Uh, you can actually be engaged in spiritually meritorious activity if you wage war against um, these non-Christian powers, the, the actual enemies of God. Uh, you know, similarly, um, if, if you go to war uh, against the, the Baltic people, uh, the, the pagan Baltic, uh, some pagan Baltic group, you know, the Northern Crusades, that can be sacramental warfare also. And then uh, the Albigensian Crusade, uh, you know, to, to, to wipe out heresy, that can also be spiritually meritorious. But it's not spiritually meritorious to wage a just war against a Christian power, against Christians, because they're Christians. The king, if you go to war with the king of France and it's justified, it's just war, he's still a Christian king and he still rules over Christian people. So it's not sacramental warfare, but we're looking at how this develops. Um, and this, the Old Testament, I think, plays a huge role in ultimately um, uh, triggering and uh, actualizing this idea of, of sacred warfare. Because this old uh, Roman concept, uh, or Aristotelian concept, Greek concept, it's a lot more uh, legalistic. You know, uh, well, when, when is it legally you know, justified to fight? But uh, this biblical concept from the Old Testament is much more spiritual, much, much more about uh, uh, the divine will and uh, pleasing the divine by, by fighting uh, God's enemies. So there's another element that's going to influence how medieval uh, Latin Christians view um, the Crusades and how the, Crusa the idea of the Crusades comes to be, and that is the Germanic influence. So remember, after the fall of the Western Roman Empire, a lot of the uh, new warrior aristocracies in the West were these Germanic peoples, the so-called barbarians, as the, the old Romans like to call them, the Franks. 
the Visigoths, etc. By the 8th century, the ruling elites of Italy, Gaul, Spain, and the Eastern British Isles are mostly Roman Christian, but they still maintain a lot of their pre-Christian sensibilities. So in this more Germanic conception, war is actually a moral action, and indeed, the, the life of the warrior is a higher way of living than peace. There's this emphasis on the honor of the warrior who goes willingly to battle, who would rather be in battle than be, be idle. That's where he's truly actualized. That's where he's tr- his greatness occurs, is in battle. So see how different this is in this more legalistic, you know, Roman conception. Um, indeed, I would say it resembles in some respects the, uh, the Old Testament idea. I think it's different in that it's more about warfare just for itself, not necessarily um, for, uh, for God. But there's a spiritual element to it, undoubtedly. Um, the old Germanic religion had this, this highly spiritualized way of looking at warfare. You know, the warrior, he goes to Valhalla. Um, the divine uh, is pleased by uh, valor in arms, by the, the, the honorable uh, warrior who's, who's loyal to his, his people. He's loyal to his, uh, his, lo- his commander, you know, his comrades. So these are, there's a spiritual element to this, undoubtedly. And we can see how this came to deeply influence medieval Christian culture. This had a huge in- impact. You know, we talk about um, the Germanic barbarian peoples converting to Christianity, but we can't forget how much the Germanic mores and ideas influenced Western Christianity had an impact. A lot of the reason for this is the the, uh, vacuum of political authority left by the collapse of Rome. In the absence of the centralized political authority, the war band becomes the means of uh, maintaining order or social cohesion cohesion in the midst of uh, a rather chaotic situation. The war band with the warrior chieftain and his men who are loyal to him plunder and tribute provide the economic uh, uh, stability, you know, if, if we can call it that. But um, that's kind of how, that's how the economy is, is driven in some aspects. The church in the West began to recognize some of the values of the Germanic people, the honor and the valor. Uh, Clovis the Frank and Oswald of Northumbria were praised as defenders of the faith and kind of held up as these early proto you know, Germanic Christian heroes, even though, you know, frequently in their dealings, uh, they were, they were less than holy. I mean, uh, oftentimes they were just, they were engaged in the, the brutal daily realities of the war band, you know, competing with other war bands, but, um, but they became part of Christian lore in the West. By the time we get to Charlemagne, and the revival of the Western Roman Empire, where Charlemagne is uh, crowned as, whole, uh, well, as the first Western Roman emperor in, in quite some time. Crowned by the Pope. So Charlemagne now uh, is defender of the Christian people. And his empire, his social order, his state, is, uh, is God's arm on earth. Uh, enforcing God's... Uh, God's will, or acting to um, to actualize the uh, this the Christian social order. Uh, in, in a lot of ways, this this harkens us back to the the uh, old Christian Roman Empire uh, that um, that Augustine would have known. Um, Charlemagne kind of takes up that uh, that same identity as those old uh, uh, Christian Roman emperors, except uh, with. There's a Germanic element to it now, the, uh, this uh, distinctly Germanic warrior ethos. Charlemagne's wars against heathens and uh, the conversion of pagan peoples at the, at the tip of, of the Frankish sword, this was uh, praised as, uh, as good. This is God, uh, God's, God is working through this. Prayers and masses are offered that victory might be achieved in these battles that Charlemagne will engage in. One example of this, of course, is the conquest of the Saxons, uh, the subduing of a pagan people, 
and uh, making them into Christians, uh, forcing them into Christianity. This is uh, viewed positively by the church. This is, again, this is God's will being carried out by the state. The, uh, the Holy Roman emperors would carry into battle the relic of St. Martin, that they might be victorious. Again, this harkens us back to, uh, to both uh, the, the old Christian Roman emperors, but also I think this really kind of reminds us of the Old Testament warfare, you know, this kind of uh, spiritual, spiritually uh, imbued warfare. This is not just legalistic, uh, you know, just war anymore. This is, this is the beginning of, of the thinking that um, is going to, to make the Crusades such an a integral part of uh, civilization in the high Middle Ages. So we can see how the virtue of the Frankish warrior, you know, his honor, his valor in battle, his loyalty to his comrades, this kind of merges with the good Christian, you know, the faithful Christian who's faithful to God's laws. These things, uh, they work together and they're coming together. All of this is going to be reinforced by the Saracen and Viking invasions. Uh, the Saracens, of course, conquer Spain and uh, almost press into uh, France, except they're stopped by the Franks at uh, Tours in 732. And then in the 9th century, the Saracens are going to conquer Sicily and threaten Italy very seriously. The Viking invasions of the 9th century are a, a tremendous trauma to, uh, to the Western Christian world. They are viewed as attacks by, by evil. Uh, almost demonic attacks. You know, we, we look at uh, the way these attacks by these heathen peoples are interpreted. Uh, these heathen peoples are the ultimate other. You know, these are the forces of darkness made manifest in men. Um, they're almost not men. They're almost just beasts, you know, uh, demons attacking the good Christian people, the faithful. You can see how this question of that we, you know, in, in the more cosmopolitan, uh, more connected postmodern world, you know, you know, we wrestle with these concepts of the other. Uh, this wasn't wrestled with in, uh, in the Middle Ages. You know, the other was the other. Fearsome and terrifying and to be defeated by, uh, hopefully, by good Christian warriors. As we get into... The, uh, the Middle Ages, the early Middle Ages into the High Middle Ages, we can even see there starts to be some blurring of the lines between clergy and warrior. During the Viking attack on Paris in the 9th century, we have an example of a chronicler praising a monk who used a ballista against the Vikings. It says he was capable of piercing seven men with a single arrow, in jest, he commanded some of them to be taken to the kitchen. Isn't that fascinating? So is this the first Knight Templar? <laughs> no, of course not. But, but, you know, we can see how things are changing. There are even tales of apparitions of St. Benedict himself appearing on the battlefield, fighting against the Vikings. Now, I think that this early sort of Germanic Christian spirituality is quite interesting. The view of Christ. You know... The, the early Germanic peoples, when they first converted to Christianity, they didn't really have a, a penchant for this, um, these kind of esoteric concepts of sin and salvation and uh, how all that took place. They, they more identified Christ as sort of a valiant warrior. Uh, in, we have an old English poem, The Dream of the Rude. There is this idea of Christ as the young warrior, as the Lord of victories who, after his victory on the cross, ascends to a Valhalla-like heaven where the people of God are feasting. So the old Germanic ways of, of looking at uh, combat are kind of being reborn in Christ, Christ as the warrior chieftain in some ways. And indeed, what's the title of Christ in the High Middle Ages? Lord, our Lord. He's the liege Lord of mankind. He's, he's the chieftain, you know, in, in, in some ways. It's this, this concept of a warrior chieftain. Uh, Christ becomes the liege lord of, of Christendom, you know, of all of, of, all of mankind. Um, his mother is Our Lady, you know, the lady of, uh, of the kingdom. 
There is a 9th century Old German poetic rendering of the gospel called the Heliand, in which uh, some of the familiar passages from the gospel are reinterpreted in a way that made more sense to, to the Germanic peoples. So, for example, from the Sermon on the Mount, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy, from Matthew. This becomes, Blessed are those who have kind and generous feelings within a hero's chest. The powerful Holy Lord will be kind and generous to them. So this concept of the warrior chieftain kind of uh, uh, taking care of his men, um, this resonates with the Germanic people. Christ is their, their warrior chieftain who will, who will take care of them. He's pleased by their, their virtues, their manly virtues. So it's very interesting. I mean, this is, and this all has an influence on, on uh, you know, once uh, these Germanic peoples kind of grow up and they're no longer kind of, uh, they go from being sort of these proto-barbarians or, um, you know, new Christians in the early Middle Ages to they become a, a very civilized uh, people in the high Middle Ages. These concepts still inform their, their, uh, their civilization. You know, high medieval civilization is kind of this blending of this old Germanic thing, you know, with the, and this Roman thing. And uh, this Old Testament uh, Judaic tradition. So it's all there. So that's just an overview of the history of how uh, holy war or just war or, uh, was viewed in the Christian world and uh, the, the traditions that in, uh, informed it. So I think we can kind of see how as, as uh, medieval Europe begins to grow up and blossom into the high Middle Ages, how uh, the, the church and its uh, Roman traditions and the, uh, the aristocracy, the warrior aristocracy with their Germanic traditions begin to blend together. And uh, this devotion to the Old Testament, you know, which is, uh, which really, I mean, it's, it's hard to tell the difference between the concept of holy war in uh, the Old Testament and the concept of holy war that would exist during the era of the Crusade. I mean, we can see how this concept was so resonant in uh, the era when Christians were fighting against uh, the Muslim powers. So yeah, we can see how, how this is uh, all coming to, inf it's going to inform the Crusades. And it's, it's really, it makes a lot of sense that this concept of the Crusade would come to fruition in the high Middle Ages as, as Europe was on the rise. So but we'll, look at, we'll look at that uh, some more next time. So thanks very much, guys, for, for listening. I think this is a very interesting subject. It's quite intriguing. And um, if you like what I do, please support me on Patreon and uh, pick up a copy of my novel of the Crusades, Why Does the Heathen Rage? I'll talk to you soon.